Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to St. John's. This is the place where man, it's the fifth Sunday of Easter. He is risen. He is risen. Hallelujah. I'll turn your attention to reflecting his life. Got a few things to throw your way before we get started. Uh, upcoming events. I know there's no actual dates on these two yet, but I just want to get them uh, on your general radar. First, I'd like to have a new members class on sometime on a weekend in June. I'm still figuring out an exact date for that, but it'll probably be like a Friday night into Saturday morning kind of class, two-day. Um, this, if you've been to one of these before, uh, this is the, the path to membership. Uh, very basic, what we believe, teach, and confess, through the doctrine. Um, if you uh, would like to join St. John's as a member, this is definitely the way to do so. Um, or if you uh, are a member already, and thought, this sounds like a really cool idea just to get the basics back in my head. Would love to attend. Pastor Jay, can I? Yes, absolutely. Would love to have you. It would be fun. And plus, you get to meet some people and hang out. Uh, so if, uh, if that sounds like something for you, keep your eyes open for a date. I'll probably very soon I'll get that to you. Thank you for everyone who signed the sign-up sheet for Vacation Bible School. I'm still just nailing down the details on the week and doing a little bit more digging to find some volunteers to see which week would be uh, the best for that. But thank you so much for everyone who has noted that they would be available and willing and thus far. This week, we're continuing our Bible study on the book of Ruth. We just finished Judges two weeks ago, and we began the book of Ruth, so uh, there's still time to join and get the story down. We just begun um, the, the uh, Zoom information is up here, spiritual growth, <laughs> excuse me, opportunities. Uh, and one more thing, we uh, don't talk about this uh, enough, but we have a mission of the month. Um, we are still giving to our missions of the month. This month uh, and next is the Lutheran Family Community Services. Lutheran Family and Community Services. With that, everything we need to know is in the bulletin or up on the screen. May God bless our time together and fill us once again with his promises. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we thank you for bringing us here into this place. We thank you for your promises, which are true in and through your Son, Jesus. Fill us with your Spirit to guide us in all truth, and may we leave in peace. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand as we sing our opening hymn. Hallelujah. Let praises ring.
the Holy Spirit. Amen. Alleluia. Christ is risen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? God's grace knows no bounds. Through the sacrifice of his son, the bridegroom of the church, he makes us his holy bride. Anticipating the heavenly wedding feast, let us seek God's grace now and call on him for forgiveness and mercy. Almighty God, have mercy on us, for we cannot help ourselves. Forgive us all that we have done in the past. Give us grace in this present time, and lead us to serve you and love one another in the future, and on into the eternity you have promised. Jesus promised the disciples, your sorrow will turn into joy, and he promises the spring of the water of life without payment. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord.
that among the many changes of this world, our hearts may be fixed where true joys are found. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated for the readings of God's Word. The first reading is taken from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 11, verses 1 to 18. Now the apostles and the brothers who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party criticized him, saying, He went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. But Peter began and explained it to them in order. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision, something like a great sheep descending, being let down from heaven by its four corners, and it came down to me. Looking at it closely, I observed animals and beasts of prey, reptiles and birds of the air. And I heard a voice saying to me, Rise, Peter, eat and kill. But I said, By no means, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But the voice answered a second time from heaven. When God has made clean, do not call upon me. This happened three times, and all was brought up again into heaven. And behold, at the very moment, three men arrived at the house in which we were, sent to me from Caesarea. And the Spirit told me to go with them, making no distinction. These six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. And he told us how he had seen the angel stand in his house and say, Send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will declare to you a message by which you will be saved, you and all your household. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on him, just as on us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us, when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? When they heard these things, they fell silent, and they glorified God, saying, And to the Gentiles also, God has granted repentance that leads to life. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us praise our Lord together using the words of Psalm 148. Together, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise Him in the heights. Praise Him, all His angels. Praise Him, all His hosts. Praise Him, sun and moon. Praise Him, all you shining stars. Praise Him, you highest heavens and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created, and he established them forever and ever. He gave a decree, and it shall not pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures in all deeps, fire and hail, snow and mist, stormy wind fulfilling his word, mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, Beasts and all livestock, creeping things and flying birds, kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the earth, young men and babies together, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His majesty is above earth and heaven. He has raised up a horn for his people. Praise for all his saints for the people of Israel who are near to him. Praise the Lord. The epistle is taken from the Apocalypse, the revelation of Jesus Christ to the Apostle John. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride born for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, 
Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain in them. For the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Omega, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give for the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. This is the word of the Lord. God. Please stand. Hallelujah. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. Hallelujah. Gospel according to St. John, the 16th chapter. Jesus said, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. A little while and you will see me no longer. And again a little while and you will see me. So some of his disciples said to one another, What is this that he says to us? A little while and you will not see me. And again a little while and you will see me. And because I am going to the Father. So they were saying, What does he mean by a little while? We do not know what he is talking about. Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him, so he said to them, Is this what you are asking of asking yourselves, what I meant by saying, a little while and you will not see me, and again a little while and you will see me? Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. So also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated for our hymn of the day.
the small catechism because of the conditions that he observed when he was out visiting churches. In his own words, this is what he saw. The common man, especially in the villages, knows practically nothing of the Christian doctrine. And many of the pastors are almost entirely incompetent and unable to teach. Yet all the people are supposed to be Christians, have been baptized and received the Holy Sacrament, even though they don't know the Lord's Prayer, the Creed, or the Ten Commandments, and live like poor animals of the barnyard and pig pen. Small Catechism then was written to help teach, to inform. Uh, first, you know, pastors to their congregations and also fathers to their households. So not only, you know, if you ever spend some time with some catechism, not only is it the clear text of uh, the, the six chief parts, we call them, you know, we've got uh, the creed, the Lord's Prayer, the Ten Commandments, and so on, but each of these uh, sections is explained. Martin Luther gives a, a nice little explanation on them. Um, and that explanation starts with the good Lutheran question. What does this mean? You already know. Luther then, of course, explains the meaning of these things clearly and, um, and succinctly. That the small catechism is one of many fantastic tools that God gives us to help us understand uh, what he has revealed to us. There are things that we can understand. We're growing in knowledge. We have a lot more answers than we might think. But then, of course, there are times when you're reading the Bible and you might have a slightly different question than Martin Luther's question. What in the world does this mean? Any of you had that question pop up or something like it? I know this is true because I teach Bible study, right? And in Bible study, there's parts we come across where like, wait, what in the world? does this mean? What is Jesus saying? What does this sentence mean? Uh, it's not uncommon for a passage to not make sense. It may be a bit afraid to ask, what does this mean? There are also times, uh, maybe you're talking with someone, a friend, someone, a co-worker who's not a Christian, or maybe of a, a different church body, uh, and they ask you something about the Bible or about your faith, and you say, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I'm going to have to do some research. Um, Pastor Jake, what's going on? Um, we, it's okay, you know. Sometimes we just don't know the answer. All I'll just say, uh, you can see where I'm going with this, our gospel text is dealing with a lack of understanding. The disciples, they don't understand specifically what's going to happen with Jesus. So to put this conversation that happens in our text in a context, this is on Monday, Thursday. Okay, so before Jesus died, before he rose from the dead, this is the night when he's arrested. He's in the upper room with his disciples. This whole section from like John 14 to 17 is all this upper room discourse. So he's telling them, you know, I'm going to go away for a while. We know, oh, okay, we know what he's talking about. They don't. Um, he's going to be arrested later that night, but that arrest, Trial, all the things that are going to happen, his suffering, his crucifixion, his resurrection, these things are beyond their understanding. And it certainly didn't fit the picture of what they thought the Messiah, the Savior, would do. So Jesus is speaking, and they're turning to themselves and they're saying things like, What is this? <laughs> what in the world is he saying? Uh, what does this mean? What is he talking about? And they don't muster up the, the courage to ask him. But Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him about these things. So here's the scene to sum it all up. Jesus is speaking to disciples who don't understand. And where that fact meets us this morning is here. Now, how Jesus deals with them is a picture of how Jesus deals with us. And even more specific, how Jesus deals with the lack of Understanding. Well, I want you to notice what he doesn't do. He knows that they are without understanding of the things he's saying. He doesn't give them all the answers, does he? They don't walk away from that night having a crystal clear picture of everything that's about to happen. That comes 
later for them. He doesn't give them uh, some immediate revelation, and he doesn't pack their bags and send them away on a weekend seminar on systematics and doctrines. So what does he do, and what does he give them? He gives them a promise. That's right, a promise. Jesus addresses the lack of understanding with a promise. He's going to send his spirit to them. His spirit will guide them in all truth. And Jesus told them that he'd see them again. And when he did, their sorrow would turn to joy. So dear friends, if you've ever had to ask the slightly different Lutheran question, what in the world does this mean? I've got some good news for you. Being a Christian doesn't mean that we have all the answers. Being a Christian doesn't mean that God demands complete understanding. What being a Christian, a disciple of Jesus means, is that God has promised to send his spirit to us. And he has. We've been given the Holy Spirit in our baptism. And as Jesus said, the Holy Spirit will take what is mine and declare it to you. And what does he declare? A promise. Your sins are forgiven. And you will see me again. And when you do, your hearts will rejoice and no one will take your joy from you. Just to continue to hammer the point, how does God deal with a lack of understanding? The same way he deals with those who think they know everything. He gives them a promise. This is a good word for today, for a world that, um, that has people who turn away from Christianity without even really knowing what they're turning away from. So for the sake of simplicity, to use our text as a basis for the vocabulary, I'll say it this way. You've got two extremes. There's the assumption that you have to have all the answers. Right? You have to know everything. To be a faithful disciple of Jesus, or to be a member of the church, or uh, to be able to even go to Bible study, or to be active, or to belong, you have to know everything, or at least a good amount, right? That can't be the case. Goodness, friends, look at the disciples. Jesus didn't use the brightest crayons in the box, the sharpest tools in the shed, uh, as Paul in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise. <laughs> not many of you were of noble birth. All right? um, it's not you. All right? God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. So then, of course, there's the other side, the other assumption that becoming a Christian means that you turn off your brain and that you stop thinking altogether. And that's not the case either. Our faith isn't blind. We made a big point of this in our Lenten series. God worked good from evil through his son, Jesus. And Jesus is our reason and our proof. We know that he's working all things good. The proof is the cross, the resurrection for us. And God has also given us reason to serve our continued learning of the scriptures. Right? And digging through the depths of God's grace. We use our reason to help understand, you know, like the small catechism, things that we can know and understand. Both assumptions are wrong. <laughs> and both come back, baby, come back. And both are idols. That's right. Total understanding on the one hand becomes an idol. Because we're not saved by what we know or how well we can wrap our minds around the mysteries of God. And on the other hand, willful ignorance is also an idol. We're not saved because we blindly follow. We're saved, dear friends, because Jesus looks at us confused sinners with a lack of understanding. And he has mercy on us. He alone is God, and he alone has total understanding. That includes knowing what you need. And because he's good, and because he loves you, 
He has love towards sinners. He desires to give you what you need. So how does God deal with sinners? The same way he deals with wayward sheep. The same way he deals with a lack of understanding. He gives you a... Oh, my friend, I think we're starting to get it. He gives you a... Good. He gives you this word, this external word in the form of a promise preached to you. A promise that is true because Jesus died and rose for you. Jesus died for those that think that they know better than God. Jesus died for those who believe that the truth is relative, subjective, personal. Jesus died for those who put their trust in their wisdom and how much they know. And he also died for the willfully ignorant. Jesus died and rose to bring the eternal mystery of salvation to all people. And that means you. It is a mystery, after all. Yes, there are some things that we can't know. Actually, a lot of things that we can't know. There's much to learn from the scriptures. And we can spend lifetimes exploring the depths of God's grace for sinners and his word. And we can barely scratch the surface. And we have wonderful tools like Luther's small catechism and Bible study and, well, hopefully educated pastors who know how to rightfully teach and preach the word and distinguish between law and gospel. Pastors are stewards of the mysteries of God. And there are times or things that our mind just won't be able to comprehend. We won't be able to wrap our head around completely. Like the Trinity. Oh my goodness, Aaron really sat down and thought about the nature of the Trinity. We can explain it. We have some really good creedal responses to it. But when you try to sit down and make it make sense, it doesn't, right? Um, and that's okay. Or eternity. I'm going to sit down and think about eternity. I'm not going to get you started on that. That's okay. God's promises actually help us to live in the mystery. God's promises actually help you live in that tension. His promises sustain us and they actually do something here and now. They keep us learning, for one, as we grow in our understanding. And they also comfort us and reassure us as we come across things that cause us to ask, what in the world does that mean? So no matter what, friends, whether we're scratching our heads in confusion, or wondering what in the world Jesus could possibly mean, or we've received and learned the answer, no matter what, we know this for sure. We have a promise. Jesus sees us. He loves us. He knows what we need, and he desires to give it to us. So he gives you a promise. He promises to be with you. He promises to keep you. He promises to hold you in his hands like a good shepherd, right, who will never let you go. He forgives your sins and promises to raise you from the dead. And just as he promised his disciples in our text this morning, he promises again to you. I will see you again. And when I come back, your hearts will rejoice. And no one will take your joy away from you. Amen. Please stand. Let us confess our faith together using the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and was made man 
and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Let us pray to God on behalf of the church and all people and their various needs. You told Peter, what God has made clean do not call common. Remember those people on the margins of society, O Lord. Provide caring people and institutions, open doors of opportunity, and free them from the results of their past poor decisions. Bridegroom of the church, in your mercy. Peter and the others recognized that they could not stand in God's way. Guide the church's clergy and lay leaders here and around the world to seek your will, Lord Jesus, working together creatively to find new ways to spread the gospel in accord with your will. Bridegroom of the church, in your mercy. Amen. Holy Lord, in John's vision, you proclaimed, Behold, I am making all things new. Graciously work through the talents and knowledge of meteorologists, naturalists, engineers, and visionaries as they seek to find ways to renew the health of this planet. Grant that seed time and harvest, sun and rain, produce bountiful harvests, and we all rejoice in your many blessings. Bridegroom of the church, in your mercy. Yeah. Lord over all, as you foretold, often we will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. So we see injustice, oppression, constant warfare and unrest in many nations. Raise up wise leaders intent on serving their citizens, police and first responders focused on maintaining the peace. And armed forces determined to reestablish calm. Bridegroom of the church, in your mercy. Amen. Gracious Savior, by the faith given us by the Holy Spirit, we look forward to the wedding feast of the Lamb, who will end mourning, crying, and pain. Before we enter that time of rejoicing, we bring the petitions of people near and dear to us as they call out in sorrow through tears and enduring pain, including Jane Witt, Allison, Chris Turner, Barbara Stanisic, Donald Wicks Jr., Greg and Karen Lucas, Anita Heat, Dick Bobones, Don Dora Slanning, Mike Lanning, Diane Jellema, Teresa, Doris U. Listening, family, Kelvin Tong, Eric Brody, David Anton, Carol Roach, Marilyn Stone, Charlie Stone, Paul Albertson, Rocco Campanelli, Kevin and Leah Franciotti, John Matern, Michael Kratz, Matthew Basirko, Lisa, Chris, and Olivia, Abigail Hope, Lisa, Norman Lamby, Bill, Jennifer Christofferson, Christopher De Palma, Kathy Kern, Monica Peschel, Natalie Piper, Scott and Lena, everyone suffering from the attacks in Ukraine, and those we name in our hearts. As fits your gracious plans, give them peace, joy, and relief. Bridegroom of the church, in your mercy. Amen. Into your hands, Heavenly Father, we commend ourselves and all for whom we pray, trusting that you have heard us for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated as we continue with our offering.
sacrificed for us and bore the sins of the world. By his dying, he has destroyed death. And by his rising again, he has restored to us everlasting life. Therefore, with Mary Magdalene, Peter and John, and with all the witnesses of the resurrection, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying,
gospel and communion on communion now. We open the bread. Take and eat the body of Christ given for you. We open the cup. Take and drink the blood of Christ shed for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. Amen. We continue with our distribution.
And now may this true body and this true blood strengthen and preserve you steadfast in the true faith, now until life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. Please stand.
abounding grace of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Blessings on your week. Amen. Thank you.